VO2 max is a metric that was once referred to as untrainable and being limited by genetics. Only minor improvements were thought possible. But recent research and examples such as Oscar Svedson, the record holder who increased from a level of 74.6 milliliters per kilogram per minute to 96.7, an increase of 30% in just 29 months, proves this is not the case. In fact, most individuals are more than capable of greatly increasing. While you may not reach the record holder, you might be surprised how much you can improve, and you may be even more surprised about the workouts needed to accomplish it. I think all of us have a general idea that a VO2 max effort means going all out for between 3 and 8 minutes. But what exactly is the body doing differently in these zone 5 efforts above 105% of FTP? As you begin riding, your muscles use oxygen to fuel the aerobic system. This system utilizes oxygen to break down fats and carbs into energy, or ATP. As you ride harder, eventually you hit a point where oxygen demand is higher than the cardio system's ability to provide it, and you enter the anaerobic state. VO2 max is your maximal aerobic capacity and provides a measure of how efficient your cardio system is at delivering oxygen to the muscles and how efficient muscles are in using that oxygen. This oxygen delivery is similar to how you would make an online order. If your muscles need O2, it would place an order sending a message to the cardio system. When this order is received, it packages oxygen in red blood cells and sends it out in delivery trucks. Riders with a higher VO2 max have a higher cardio system response and have more delivery vehicles traveling faster. Your VO2 max can be shown in two ways, but in cycling, it is typically shown as the relative number. Surprisingly, I found VO2 max has implications beyond cycling. In this study, it shows that it has a link to decreasing mortality rates over a decade. The study considered 122,000 people with an average age of 53 and ranked them into percentiles. Notice how even increasing from below average to above average has a reduction in mortality risk of 41%. This is the same as a non-smoker versus smoker. Although I'm going to assume if you're watching this video, you're likely more fit than the general population, there remains a reduction in risk even increasing from a higher baseline. Most research suggests similar health benefits. For example, this study found that each 1 milliliter per kilogram per minute increase was associated with a 45-day increase in longevity. The purpose is not to make this into a health video, but to show impacts beyond just cycling performance. But let's get back to why it matters in cycling. VO2 max matters because these efforts are often required at points on the course where splits occur. If the bunch is going all out, you want to be using the more sustainable aerobic system as long as possible. As you keep pushing harder and longer, your body will reach a point where the anaerobic system kicks in. If you use this system before others, you may be more likely to be dropped. From a prior example, imagine if instead of one online order, you made 100. However, the delivery trucks can only handle 50 packages, and thus a new shipping method is required. Maybe the company needs to buy air freight to get the package to you. But shipping by air freight costs a lot more than a simple truck meaning your package will get to you in an inefficient way. This is like the relationship between aerobic and anaerobic systems. The aerobic system can produce up to 38 molecules of ATP, whereas the anaerobic system will only produce 2 ATP from glucose. We can see why aerobic efforts are so much more efficient. Not only will a high VO2 max help with these efforts, but it will provide all around better results. Let's consider time trials. Although they are completed with 99% of the time in an aerobic zone, this study shows that after an individual completed HIT training sessions and boosted VO2 max by 10.3%, he was able to improve TT performance by 15%, thus demonstrating additional benefits. A common misconception is VO2 max is how much air your lungs can take in. However, it's how much oxygen your body can utilize from what is available. What determines your VO2 max is essentially your cardiac output multiplied by the amount of O2 your muscles utilize. Cardiac output can be broken into stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume is how much blood is pumped by the heart. Increasing stroke volume would be like increasing the amount of delivery vehicles available in our prior example. 
and research has shown that improving VO2 max is primarily associated with improved cardiac output. Since we know heart rate can't be trained to go higher, stroke volume is what we should focus on training. Surprisingly, the best method isn't just going day after day at all-out interval efforts. We know that stroke volume is the most trainable factor, and studies show a correlation between training volume and stroke volume. This is especially true for newer or riders with a lower fitness level. And it makes sense, as we know that if you have a lower fitness level, that, well, just about any type of increase in training will also increase fitness. This suggests that most of the improvement will come from high volume, low intensity training away from your key race dates. However, the closer you are at a peak or elite level, the more important including HIT training becomes. If your goal is to increase from 50 to 75, you should plan on the initial increase to 65 to be from higher volume training. As your approach races and training becomes more specific is when you should consider HIT training. This high intensity training will provide the last boost to your VO2 max. Essentially, it's icing on the cake. Studies show only a few sessions will lead to improvements, with each session providing up to 0.5% gain. However, the reason you can't do it year-round is the body will adapt to the stress and a plateau will occur shortly after. Not only will the body adapt, but an effective hit session should mean you are completely out of gas by the final interval. This can be grueling on the body and taxing mentally, causing you to question why you are training at all. High intensity interval training, or HIT, can be broken out into two types, short interval and long interval, which can be incorporated two to three times per week. This is specific training and will be most effective in a six week block during your race specific training. In a six week block, I might have two weeks with these followed by a lighter rest week and then repeat. The key to doing these is to target a heart rate about 90% of your max. As the goal is quality over quantity, getting your heart rate near your max on the first one will mean you've gone too hard, and chances are your final intervals will suffer or you won't be able to complete them. If you can't finish an interval workout, it does you no good. However, there is much debate to which type of workouts shown here are better, with some research showing that doing 3x13, 3015 SI blocks had greater responses compared to individuals doing LI blocks. I plan to do a video on the differences, but the issue I have with this study is the participants did the intervals at the highest average power output possible. Unsurprisingly, the SI averaged more power while the total time was set to be roughly the same. Overall, I find it's best to utilize a mix of both. However, with so many options, I believe the simpler, the better. Many plans have complex steps before, during, or after each interval, but there's no science to back up these complex plans are better. It is simply set up this way to hold your attention. Finally, the intervals I showed have varying degrees of recovery between intervals. The best rule of thumb is you should try and match the plan's recovery phase to the type of riding you do. If you race in events with repeated attacks that need to be covered, a shorter rest period will work better. If you're in events where only one big effort is needed, maybe you're setting out to set PRs on Leith Hill or your local climb. A longer rest period will work better. I personally like to incorporate a mix though. Now you know when and how to train it, how do you compare it to others? Cyclists are known to have some of the highest VO2 maxes of any sport. Although cross-country skiing is higher, cyclists are close behind. While most of us won't match Oscar Svensson's world record of 96.7, we can still train our VO2 max to increase. Although there are devices sold to test your VO2 max, most of us haven't performed these tests. But the typical ranges are shown here, breaking it down into an untrained, trained, and elite category. Most of us watching this video will fall into the trained range. And fortunately for most of us, we can improve significantly. Take this case study for example, where an amateur increased VO2 max from 53 to 74, or 40%. While this is an extreme case, anecdotal evidence suggests a 15% gain may be possible in as little as 4 to 6 weeks. And training over the long term can produce average increases of 25%. This is close to the 30% gain Oscar Svensson produced over 17 months. 
Hopefully this information not only lets you improve for your next race, but also provides takeaways beyond cycling. Thank you for watching.